Hello and welcome back to Mikey's Flight Deck. Today I will show you how you can build this navigation panel and configure it with MobiFlight and ProSim. You will need the top panel piece and the bottom and middle piece, as well as a black push button and the dual rotary encoder we have built before. Some of the holes are countersunk to insert hidden screws. After the good experiences with professional made PCBs for the electric panel and the cabin pressurization panel, I again designed an individual PCB as a holder for the seven segment displays and the transfer button. Ten years later, here they are. I will use two of them for the two navigation panels, so there are still some over which you can buy from me if you are building your panels after my plans, then they should be useful for you. So now I have to install all the needed components onto the PCB and after this mounting the PCB behind the panels. Place the illuminated push button with a 12 volt ground pin to the top of the PCB. The transfer button knobs for all the pedestal panels are prepared at the same time. The next step is to engrave these transfer buttons and I will do this step here on my laser. Those of you who have watched my IRS panel video will know this technique already. I'm using a scrap piece of 3mm HDF board and cut in the outline shapes of the buttons a little bit bigger so that I can align these buttons into this piece here. I won't move this piece during the whole process so that the buttons are aligned to the axis of the laser and the laser knows where he has to engrave later. Of course I don't do this whole process just for one single button. I have prepared all the transfer buttons for all the pedestal panels in one step and so this will go really fast. I had the fear that the PCB um, could wiggle when I push the transfer button because uh, the two screws are building one line and this would be an axis on that the PCB could wiggle. But when I now see uh, this tight fit of um, the seven segment displays I think this fear was completely unnecessary. Anyway, I have designed a little bit longer PCB spacer here that holds the correct distance of the PCB to the panel and holds the PCB in place. And this is a little bit longer to the back so uh, that the wiggling would be stopped. But as I said, this PCB will go nowhere.
as a nut for the fixing screws and as a spacer for the backlighting panel I used 15mm hex standoffs. Now after the panel is assembled, we will have a look into the configuration in MobiFlight and ProSim. Let's have a look at the configuration in ProSim first, because there will be a surprise for you. You will find all the needed configurations here under Config and Configuration and in the Combined Config tab. You can make it yourself a little bit easier and search for NAV2. So here we have 14 results in the navigation category and there we will have our value that we have to configure under switches and here we find the test button to which I already assigned an offset and a bit. And now here comes a big surprise, this is the only configuration you have to do for this panel here in ProSim. Yes, because all other values are already known by fs 2 ipc and already used by the simulator. And how do you know which values are already there? This is what I will show you now in the fs 2 ipc documentation. So here now we have the fs 2 ipc offset documentation. You will find this in your FSUIPC folder when you have installed it or just Google it, you will get some results. And when I searched for NAV2 in this document, I came across one entry here, the offset 3123 radio standby swap toggles. You can write or read the state of the button and you can see there are four buttons covered in this um, offset here. The communication one and two panel and the navigation one and two button here. And this is exactly what we need now. How does it work? Well, just like we already do it with other buttons here in MobiFlight. We will set one bit of the byte to one or zero and this communicates via FSU IPC if this button is pressed or not. In our case the first bit or the zero bit is used to communicate the state of this button and this is what we now will do in MobiFlight. Here we can have a quick look at the devices I have configured by the way, if you are new to this topic and want to know more about configuration in MobiFlight, you can watch my dedicated video where I go into everything in detail. Here in the MobiFlight modules tab, you can see I have my Arduino K connected at the moment and I already have declared all the devices that will be connected to this Arduino. For example, we have here K16 and K17, the two buttons that we have here on the panel, the test and the transfer button. I have here encoders K18-19 and K20-21. A little bit confusing names here, but I'm still experimenting with naming devices so that the names of the devices keep short, but are still enough to um, correctly identify a special device. In my case, K18 and K19 are the names of the cables which my encoder uses here. And the other cables, 22 up to 24, are used by the chips that control the seven segment displays. One thing you should keep in mind is that we are using here a dual rotary encoder which works that there are gears that transfer the rotation 
from the one side of the encoder to the other one where the uh, other encoder sits. And so one of the encoder turns like you uh, would assume it when you turn it right it will uh, recognize as a right rotation. But the other encoder, this will turn the opposite way because there are two gears that transfer the rotation. So when you turn it right, the final rotation that comes out at the encoder will be a left rotation. This you will have to keep in mind when you are assigning the left and right pin uh, for the encoders. So we just switch them for the um, outer shaft encoder and everything will work as you expected. I hope I said this before I have already done the configuration for the two buttons, the test and transfer button. If you want to know how to do configurations for buttons, then watch my MobiFlight introduction video. Let's have a look into the configuration of the transfer button, which is K17 in my case. And here you can now see I'm using the offset 3123, what we have seen in the FSU IPC documentation, and I'm using the zero bit for communicating the state of the button. So when we are on press, I will write a one into this bit and on a release a zero. This is just a normal button configuration, but you have to know the correct offset and bit that has to be used in this case. Let's go on to the next topic, the output of the seven segment displays here. This is more easier than the configuration of the encoder, so I think we should do this first. And we'll do this on the output tab here. As you have seen in the MobiFlight modules uh, manager here, I have used the name K22 up to 24 for this uh, seven segment displays. And so I will do a configuration with this here. So I will make a new configuration which I call K22, 24. And now I want to control the left display, the active one here. And so I'm adding a one behind this configuration. So let's get into the configuration here. I'm using the FSU IPC offset and which offset we'll have to use. This we also can find in the FSURPC documentation. Let's have a look to this now. We searched again for NAV2 in this document and look what we found here, the NAV2 frequency. Four digits in binary coded decimal format. This will be important for the configuration in ProSim later. A frequency of 113.45 is represented by one, three, four, five. So the leading one is assumed. And this is now what we have uh, to keep in mind during our configuration. So what we take now from this document here is the offset 0352 and that it has two bytes. So back in MobiFlight, we enter the offset we have seen before 0352 check that the size is two bytes and check the binary code checkbox. And on the display tab, we choose this as an output device. Our module is our Arduino K. It's a display module and the name is K2224. And because we want to control now the first chip with the first segment, the active segment here, we choose a one. We use all the five digits and the decimal point will be at the third place. So when we now test this, you can see all the numbers are coming in the correct uh, order and the point is at the right place. Stop it and they are away. Okay, that's it for this configuration. Now we can duplicate 
this line and name it K2224 and it is the second display. So I will name it here too. Now in the configuration we have to enter the offset for the standby value and this can be looked up also in the FSUIPC documentation. And here it is. The offset 3120 will give us the standby frequency which is handled as the same way as the active frequency. So 3120 is the name we are looking for. And in the configuration we enter this here. 3120. Everything else stays the same. And on the display tab we will now choose the second chip that controls the seven segment displays, the standby display here. Let's say test. There the numbers are lighting up and off again. So that's it for now. When we now click run, I have prepared running in the background so that FSUIPC is online. Our display should give us these values here, but you can see this here, the number isn't shown correctly. And maybe you know the reason. We remember the leading one that is assumed and we have here only a four digit number. But to get a five digit number with a leading one, we have to add 10,000 to this value here. And this is what we'll do now in the two configurations. So in the first configuration, we will edit the SIM variable here. And under more options, we check here the transform option. So the dollar sign gives us the value that we want to show and the number. But what will we do with the number? We will add 10,000 to this number. And this will do in the first and the second configuration here at 10,000. And when we now click run here, the two numbers are shown correctly. Because we haven't assigned any offsets in ProSim, we are still able to control the standby value here with this knob here in ProSim displays. So I will change this so that you can see the numbers are already reacting. Not where do we change the middle one? Here. There it is. And the numbers are already reacting and synchronized with the numbers in the simulator. Now let's come to the configuration of the encoders. But before we do this, I have forgotten to show you the result of our first configuration, the transfer button. When we now push this button here, then we can see the two values are already changing their positions. So this is working too. Now let's come to the encoders. And for this, we go to the inputs tab and we will declare a configuration with the same name of our encoders. So uh, let's start with the outer shaft, which controls all the numbers in front of the decimal point. So I will add a configuration here, which I call K18 to 19. And on the input tab, I will choose my Arduino K. The device is the K18, K19, which is this encoder. And now when I turn this left, I want to reduce all the values in front of the decimal point. And this I will do again via an FSU IPC offset. And this will be the same offset we have used before to show up these values here. So let's use an FSU IPC offset and we enter the offset 3120. And now every turn to the left should lower the value 
in front of the decimal point. So let's explain this here. And we are looking to the standby value for this. We don't look at the leading one here. We only have a look at the last four digits as a complete number. So what we change here are the hundreds of this number here. Let's have a look at our range here. The lowest value here would be 800. And so when I go down or up, the highest value would be 1700. So we have to make sure that our value stays between 800 and 1700 when we look to the 100 steps. And we can achieve this here with a little math operation. So we check if our value represented by the dollar sign is bigger or equal 900 then we can still subtract 100 from our value so when it is 900 we can go down to 800 but not more so we subtract from our value 100 otherwise we have to uh, switch to the 1700. So for example, we are at the 800 and we subtract 100. We shouldn't come out with 700, but with 1700. So we will add 900 to our value. This is the configuration for the on left. We don't need an on left fast because there are not too many values and the range is small. So uh, the normal speed would be enough. We have a look now to the on right turn. Most of the settings are the same here. The offset, the size in bytes and the binary coded decimal format. But now to our value, we have to ensure that we don't come over 1000. 700 here with the hundreds. So again, the formula starts if our value is still smaller than 1700, then we can still go up 100. So add 100 to our value. Otherwise, if we are at or above 1700 with our value, then we have to jump back down to the 800. So we will subtract 900 from our value. Again, we don't need an on right fast. And with this configuration, we can already make our first test. Moby Flight is running again, prepared is running in the background, and we are receiving here already our values and now turning the outer ring here at the panel and we see we are at an 800 value we turn right it goes up and so and does the value in our software up 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 to the 17 there we are and when we turn higher now we fall back to 800 and the same thing when we turn left down to 800 and now lower and we are back here in the 17s. So yes, the transfer button works. So now we can have a look at the numbers behind the decimal point. For this, I will duplicate the configuration I've done before. So I duplicate the row and rename it so that it matches the inner encoder here. And this I have called K20 to 21. And now we jump to the configuration. Most of the values will stay the same. We are affecting the same offset with the same settings, but we have to change the set value function here. Still, we are here at an if function, but 
what we have to look at now. When we turn the inner encoder here, so when it turns down here in steps of five, so this is the first thing we have to keep in mind. And when we go lower, below zero, you can see it starts again up uh, from 95 and it doesn't affect the numbers in front of the decimal point. So normally when you would uh, count a number down, we would go down from 10 to nine, but the number stays the same. So we have to make sure that we only affect the numbers behind the decimal point. And to identify this jump down below um, zero, uh, we have to look if our value is uh, dividable by 100. So when there would be any steps underneath 100, then uh, our value wouldn't be dividable by 100 because we are here in some values with a five or uh, which would be in, in the 10 steps. Well, I hope you understand what I mean here. So we will use a modulo operator here. If our value modulo 100, so what does this mod modulo? If you use the modulo operator to a value, in our case 100, then everything that uh, will be left over by this dividing operation will be the result of this function here. So uh, if a number is dividable clear by 100, then the rest and the result would be zero. So if this is zero, then we have a number that is dividable by 100. And then we are at a step where two zeros are behind this um, decimal point, then we will add 95 to our value. So we jump back to 95 because our value is zero at this moment. Otherwise, so when there are any other numbers behind the decimal point, then we will subtract five from our value to simulate the five steps down. So this is here, everything on the on left. Again, no on left fast configuration. And we go to the on right operation. One thing I've uh, seen during my um, tab change here, you have to look at the device here too, that the device is set to K2021 the other encoder. So don't make another configuration for the same encoder, the outer one. So again, all the values will stay the same and we go down here to our configuration. We have to look at uh, one special um, situation here. Before we have uh, looked at the change underneath zero and now we have to look at this situation here, when we have 95 behind the decimal point. So when we go up here, then we have to fall down again to zero. So now if our value modulo 100, you know this already is zero. So we have a dividable number by zero then we are here at this state. We have two zeros behind the decimal point. And then on a turn right, we can still add five to this value here. And now we'll look at this point when we are here at 95. So if our value plus five, modulo 100 is zero. So when we add five, and then we have again, two zeros behind the decimal point, then we will subtract 95 from our value. So we fall down to zero. Otherwise, we can still add five to our value. 
I know this can be a little bit overwhelming now at this moment, but take your time, have a look at this uh, formula, and I think then you will understand what it is doing. So now let's make a test of this. Now we have already the situation when we turn it right, then we would go to the 100s and so we should fall down to zero again. Let's test this here. There we are down at the zero and we turn right, then it goes up and up. And now to the left, it goes down in steps of five. And now when we are here at zero, we go down and one step more, we are starting again from 95. So switching still works. So this nav panel is working. And here are the two panels at their final places. Nice to see that so many functions are already implemented in existing FSUIPC offsets. This will save me a lot of offsets for upcoming devices. I'm looking now forward to the next panel section of the pedestal, which will be the ADF panel down here. And if you want to build your own pedestal panels during this time, then you will again find a set of DXF files and 3D print files to build your own navigation panels at home. And if you don't want to miss the upcoming episode of Mikey's Flight Deck, then subscribe to my channel to stay informed about any upcoming new video from me. So I hope we'll see us soon back on the Flight Deck.